everybody, um, and welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Alan Smeet, and I'm a professor of computing at uh, Dublin City University and uh, one of the founding directors of the Insight Centre for uh, Data Analytics. Uh, and you're at the session, which is the uh, Royal Irish Academy sponsored talk on um, Show Me Your Data, and I'll tell you who you are. Um, take um, uh, cognizance of the sign that's up, right, and I'll read through it just so that uh, you all make sure. Well, we make sure that you know what it is. So during the talk, what will happen is, is that the public data, which is traditionally and always broadcast, whether you know it or not, by your phone, um, will be collected uh, and will be displayed uh, on screen. So it will include things like the unique serial number associated with your phone, which is its MAC address, the manufacturer, so mine's an iPhone, an Apple, and potentially the names of the Wi-Fi networks that have connected to recently. So the one here, the one at work, the one wherever you may have been. And if you prefer not to have this um, uh, taken on, because as part of the, the talk, there's a demonstration of this. And if you prefer not to have your data collected, then put it to um, uh, flight mode, just as you would in an airplane. And then afterwards, all of the data that will be collected from your phones will be deleted. Um, so my, as I said, my name is Alan Smith, and I'm chairing this uh, session. Um, uh, sponsored by the Royal Irish Academy, which is Ireland's uh, leading body of experts in sciences uh, and humanities, and has been for uh, a number of centuries. Um, as part of the Royal Irish Academy, one of the structures that we have is the Domain Committees, and uh, the committee that I chair is called the Engineering and Computer Sciences Committee. And we do many things <coughs> um, for society and for science and for engineering, but one of the things we started uh, is a lecture series, uh, as you do in an academy. Um, but we decided to make the lecture series slightly different to um, the typical lecture series that happens. Um, we advertised for applicants to submit a lecture and a bio, um, in an open and well-advertised competition. Um, the shortlisted applicants, and I'm hearing a lot of echo on the sound here, the shortlisted applicants uh, were then um, interviewed and gave mock presentations, and there was a two-stage evaluation process. Um, the uh, winner of that uh, selection process was the lecture that we're going to hear um, uh, uh, this morning. Uh, and that lecture is entitled, Show Me Your Data and I'll Tell You Who You Are. Um, it's given by... Um, Dr. Brian McNamee, who's a lecturer in computer science at University College Dublin uh, and a funded investigator in the Insight Centre for Data Analytics, um, sponsored by Science Foundation Ireland. Um, uh, we gave that, or Brian gave that lecture as a kickoff in Academy House in Dawson Street um, late last year, and uh, we use Eventbrite to track participants um, just to keep numbers, uh, uh, keep a hold of numbers, and that event was sold out. Um, uh, part of the lecture series was, was that not only would Brian give the lecture in the Royal Irish Academy house, but he would then take it on tour. So he then took that same lecture and he gave it in Derry and it was sold out. And he gave it in Galway and it was sold out. And he gave it in Cork and it was sold out. And he gave it in Limerick and it was sold out. And I say sold out, it means Eventbrite reached its capacity, the room capacity. So when we saw that the data summit was coming up and the theme of the data summit resonated very much with Brian's talk, uh, we proposed to the organisers that he give the, uh, the homecoming event uh, back in Dublin, which is why uh, we have managed to get this uh, slot in the agenda for, for this. So um, happy Blooms Day, everybody. Uh, and uh, I'd like Brian to give his talk on Show Me Your Data and I'll Tell You Who You Are. And I'd like you to welcome up to the podium. So thanks very much for that introduction, Alan, and thanks to everybody for coming along. So as Alan said, I've delivered this talk over the last year or so um, around the country. Um, and the goal of it, I suppose, on the back of the, the RIA has been to try and sort of illuminate a little bit and show people what data we create and then what people do with that data and can do with that data. Um, so I'll go through this here and I'll start with a question just to have hands in the air. Does anyone in the room not have a smartphone with them in their pocket? No hands in the air. That's kind of interesting. As I've gone to more technical audiences, the likelihood of someone saying yes, I find is higher. So in the, the very technical audiences, some people will have reverted back to their old Nokia handset uh, for one reason. I don't know, is that a hipster trend um, or is it because they want to opt out from data? But the fascinating thing is we're now all kind of carrying these, these smartphone devices with us. And those smartphone devices that we carry around are phenomenal data generators. So if we imagine, I, I understand there's about 700 people at the data summit since yesterday morning when people came along up till about now, just by carrying those phones around in our pockets and interacting with those phones, we've generated about a gigabyte of data. Now, if anyone was at David Bray's talk yesterday, he was talking about petabytes and exabytes and yottabytes, 
and a gigabyte sounds a bit, a bit measly compared to that. But if you were to write down a gigabyte's worth of text, uh, that would amount to not just one set of the, the George Orr or Martin books that Game of Thrones is based on, but about 30 sets of the, the full cycle of books that the Game of Thrones uh, series is based on. I used to do that example with phone books, and I realized nobody understood what a phone book was or what that meant anymore. And that's kind of worth thinking about. So we're generating this, that's just from the people at the summit over yesterday and this morning. We're generating this phenomenal amount of data, and it's worth stopping to think a little bit about what that is. Um, and it's really an amalgamation of all the interactions we have on our device and from carrying those devices around with us. So we still use phones to make phone calls um, and to send text messages. And while the content, let's say, of the phone calls in particular isn't necessarily stored anywhere, metadata about that is. So metadata is a thing that people got very excited about when the Edward Snowden releases came out. And it's basically just data about the fact that something happened. So in this case, whenever you place a call on your mobile, a little bit of piece of data arrives into a database somewhere to say that you, given your phone number, made a call to somebody, given their phone number, at a particular time, maybe in a particular place, maybe how long that call was, maybe how much it cost you, um, and various other bits and pieces that you might be able to record about the fact that that event happened. Um, I, Leo Varadkar mentioned yesterday, I think, the 50 million emails per hour or per minute or something phenomenal like that um, that get generated. We all send lots and lots of emails on our phone and that generates a, a phenomenal amount of data. The more media savvy amongst us maybe took videos or Instagrams or Snapchats um, as they moved around the summit and all of that media data, so video and images, contributes in a big way to that, the overall collection of data that we get. Obviously then we're moving away from maybe making calls on our phones to using all these platforms like Twitter and Facebook um, Snapchat, WhatsApp, there's probably a couple of people who maybe still use uh, Foursquare for check-ins. Uh, I think we're all Foursquare are kind of diminishing a little bit as I've gone round uh, the talks. We, we've seen less and less Foursquare. Uh, maybe a couple of fit people in the room went for a run and ran up and down the, the Liffey on their way in here and maybe used an app like RunKeeper or the Garmin app. So there's lots of similar apps like that that would generate lots and lots of interesting data about where you went, how fast you went, maybe your heart rate. Um, and various other bits and pieces. So all of those are kind of interesting active data generation that we do. Um, referring back to metadata, also if you do a Google search or you visit a web page, all of those contribute to little bits and pieces of metadata at the same time. And then there's a whole series of implicit data collection that goes on. So maybe it's not that surprising to know that if I send a tweet or I send an email that a little data trail gets generated off the back of that, but just by carrying around a smart device like your phone, there's huge potential to capture other data. So for example, as you move around this building here, there's lots of Wi-Fi routers, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. Your phone is in a constant conversation with those. Um, you connect to some, you don't connect to others. There's an opportunity for data collection there. Uh, as you move around the city, the mobile phone network that you connect to, the various masts there, if you connect to a mast and then you move to a different mast, that's all opportunity for data collection again. And we tend to see that arises sometimes with the guards when they're investigating various crimes and they try to find out where somebody was. They often refer back to that data. And then obviously we can just collect that data ourselves so your phone has the capacity to collect little location breadcrumbs. Um, some apps do that. Some apps do that and you kind of wonder sometimes why they're doing that. Or you can actually collect that yourselves. So I run a little service on my phone and I've been doing it for about the last seven years called Open Paths. That records little breadcrumbs of everywhere I go, and then I can see that data, and I can never quite figure out what to do with it, uh, but I have seven years of everywhere I've been, um, and someday I'll come up with some amazing plan for that. So they're a set, and maybe it's just a subset, of the different things that contribute to that one gigabyte of data that we've all generated by moving around the summit and by carrying these smartphones in our pockets. And the interesting thing about all that is all of those little bits and pieces of data contribute to this digital you, essentially. So the trails that we see from those little bits of data, the little kind of indicators, little clues to who you are and what you do, all surround you um, in these databases that are spread out all around the world to give this digital picture of what you like, what you do, who you are, and where you go. And one thing that's really interesting is that's just the phone, right? So we're carrying around those phones. The data that I'm talking about is really just data that we can generate from that one device that we carry in our pockets. The Internet of Things and wearable devices and smart devices is exploding that again. So I have a Fitbit on my wrist. There's a, a selection of all the other activity trackers that are out there. Um, we have a, a running group. So 
so I'm a lecturer in UCD, we have a, a running group from the computer science department, and there's enough computing power strapped to various parts of that running group to launch, I'd say, a dozen spaceships, um, all tracking different bits and pieces of what we do. The extreme of that, I have one particular colleague, and some people will know who it is, uh, who has these socks. These socks are embedded with sensors on the soles of the feet. Those sensors record pressure information of every single foot strike um, as he runs around UCD, and then he can sit and analyze that data, and I guess a little bit like my location data, I don't really know what he does with this, uh, but maybe it tells him interesting things about his running form and his gait and, and maybe his likelihood to get injured. And so fitness has seen a big kind of boom in these kind of wearable devices and potential data generators, but it's spreading out more and more and more. So I really like this. This is an Irish company uh, who make this thing, the Drop Smart Scales. The Drop Smart Scales is a weighing scales, but it's an internet connected weighing scales and there's an associated app. And it delivers recipes to you and then you follow those recipes along, but every time you weigh something on the scales, that generates a little bit of data. So you've followed a step in the recipe, you've put some flour in a bowl, you've weighed that with the weighing scales. Drop Scales, no, this happened. And they're building up a big interesting picture about what you eat, what you cook, how you do it, how often you do it, that all contributes to this overall picture of you. Um, this is one, so I, I had a, a, a little girl about two years ago and I bought this and my wife doesn't let me use it. Um, it's a, an internet connected soother. So this is a soother with a little thermometer in the, the end of the soother. And when you give that soother to the baby, the baby sucks on the soother, the thermometer reads the baby's temperature, and I get a live, steady, real-time stream um, of the baby's temperature. Again, who knows what I would do with that. Uh, neither my wife nor my baby will use the soother, so it's, it's consigned to the bin at this stage. But it's interesting, we see more and more of that. So the kind of fitness type devices, they were kind of the early wearable Internet of Things type devices. Now we're seeing that creep into more and more areas. Health obviously is an, a, an obvious place to go after fitness, and I think we're just gonna see more and more and more of that because it's so cheap to build these things now. And so not only do we have all that data that our mobile devices or our smartphones that we carry create, we also have this other data surrounding us from new and interesting smart devices like the Fitbits and um, internet connected scales, but also all those things we've been doing for years like our online banking, um, other social networks we might use, um, maybe smart home devices we have, like the Climos uh, smart, smart heat controller that I've got up in the top left there. And what I want to do now is just give you a demo of, I've talked all about that data, just how easy it is to collect a rich data set. And this refers to the demo um, that Alan mentioned at the beginning there. So while everybody was filing into the room, I ran this demo. And this demo is based on the fact that as you carry your smartphone around in your pocket, that phone is constantly in a conversation with the network infrastructure in this building and any other building that you visit. So basically your phone or phone or laptop or any other device that you have is constantly basically chatting away with the infrastructure to say, hello, I'm here, this is what I am, are you something that I can connect to? Um, and in particular, your phone is looking for Wi-Fi routers. Right? So your phone wants to be always connected to Wi-Fi, so it's constantly looking out for Wi-Fi routers. And part of the protocol that underpins that infrastructure is that your phone or other devices that you carry sends out what are called probe requests to announce itself. And they're constantly just whizzing around in the room uh, beside us. And as Alan mentioned when he discussed the, the demo that we might do, the interesting thing about those probe requests is they tell a little bit about you. So what I've done is I've run a little probe request sniffer. Um, all of that data is open, it's unencrypted. There's nothing clever. I'm not a clever hacker or anything like that. This is really easy to do. I've run a little probe request sniffer and gathered up um, a set of those probe requests that are whizzing around in the room. So now I'm gonna try and do a live demo of this. Uh, I was kind of felt good when Vince Surf was saying no software ever works. So let's see how we get on with this. And let's run that. So I put up code just to say this a little bit of code. This is cobbled together again. This is very, very easy to do. So the collection that we've done has found 586 devices nearby. So in a big modern building like this, there's all kinds of interesting devices that are announcing themselves onto the internet, but a large set of those devices are probably the smartphones that you are all carrying in your pockets. And what those devices do is they announce their MAC address, which although it doesn't tell me who you are or anything like that, is a, a relatively unique identifier um, for that smart device that you're carrying. So if we do this again and you're here tomorrow, I should be able to find the same number again. There's a few nuances around that about some anonymization that sometimes happens. 
But that's kind of interesting. So without anything particularly clever, I can collect a relatively interesting data set about the people who are here. So maybe if I wanted to count the number of people who are moving through the convention center, I could use this data to do it. But the data also tells me a few extra things. Um, and again, I think this is nice to see some of the richness that we can get from data. So from the MAC addresses, I can see some manufacturers. So if I scroll down here, this is a Samsung device. And I know it's a Samsung device because the way the MAC addresses are allocated is, is regulated, and Samsung own a particular band of those MAC addresses. If I scroll down a little more, somewhere we'll see an Apple logo, I'm sure. Somewhere. Sometimes this works better than others. This is the live software bit. Lots of Samsungs. Somewhere in there, there's an Apple device. Right, I'll give up. It's in there somewhere. But I can see manufacturers of phones. The other thing that's really interesting, and this is the one that surprises people, is, and this is just a quirk of the protocol that underpins the Wi-Fi infrastructure. And it was great to hear Vin Cerf talking about developing the original internet and the protocols around that. Underpinning the, infra the, the protocol that, that runs the Wi-Fi network, not only do your phones announce themselves, but in order to be a little bit more efficient, they announce the networks they usually connect to. So they say, hello, I'm here. I'd like to connect to a network. Are you Brian's home network? Because I usually connect to that. And if you were, that would make our lives very easy. So they're constantly announcing these. So again, in that public open data set that the, your phones are announcing, I can see little bits like this. So you can see here, CCCD guest. So that device has connected before to the CCD guest uh, network here in the convention center. And it's announcing, hello, are you this? Because you're something I know how to connect to. And if we scroll down through the list again a little bit, we'll see, actually, I saw a few pass by. Here's a few that are very prolific. So this is one device announcing all of those networks that it's previously connected to. If I scroll down, you'll see one box in red. If I can find it, which is me. Uh, so I know this is my phone, and I've kind of collected up a few of these. So this isn't just what it's announcing today, but these are some of the networks that my phone has announced about me. Um, and that's kind of surprising. People don't expect that, that that kind of public data that's whizzing around about us is giving that kind of rich picture of what's going on. Because sometimes we see pretty interesting things about this. So from my set of data here, you know, well, I've been to UCD. I've been to a Radisson hotel. I've been to a VIP lounge. I don't know what I was doing there. Uh, I've been to the RIA. Um, and I've been to the Porter House in Dublin, potentially. Or I've been near those places enough for at some point my phone to connect to those Wi-Fi networks. And we go a little step further with this. Um, so now I know that my phone has connected to all these things at one point or another. There's a peculiar hobby that some computer scientists have called war driving. And what war driving involves is basically open up your laptop, driving around in your car, and scanning for wireless networks. So just looking out for wireless networks. And if you find one, you record the latitude and longitude of where you found it. It's a bit like kind of modern orienteering um, of some kind. And when you find those things, what people do is they upload the locations of those networks to central repositories. So there's a central database online called Wiggle. And Wiggle is basically a global collection of locations of Wi-Fi networks. And what I can do with this set and any other uh, Wi-Fi network names that I find in this data set is I can push those up to Wiggle and say, do you know where this is? So if I jump onto this tab, this is me uh, recently and the different Wi-Fi networks that turned up in those probe requests that my phone is constantly just broadcasting without me asking it to or knowing anything about it, um, pushed up to Wiggle to say, do you know where these things are? And for a reasonable subset of them, uh, they are included in that data set that Wiggle has. So you can see here, while well, I'm in Dublin, a good bit, the convention center is probably in there. I, I grew up in Nace, um, in Kildare. So here's me. That's me, obviously, in the VIP lounge down in Kildare, which is great. Uh, and I was in Galway recently enough, so there's some networks over in Galway. So just from that public data that my phone is broadcasting, we get sort of an interesting picture of whoever the person who owns this device is. So I don't know who it is. But from looking at maybe some interesting things about the places they've been, so I see some hotels and other bits and pieces in there, and actual locations, I can start to build up a pretty interesting picture of who that person might be. And I just throw that up. I wanted to do that demo just as an illustration of how easy it is to collect the kind of data that we're talking about, and then some of the small, easy steps that you can take to enrich that picture that we see. And if I jump back across here, 
I'm going to skip over the slides in case it didn't work. Um, what we can do with all of this data that we collect, so both the kind of data that I showed in the demo and then all those other little bits and pieces of data that we're generating that I mentioned, is we can follow those digital footprints. Right? So we're leaving these little digital footprints everywhere we go. We can start to follow them and we can start to do some interesting things with them. So for example, I was recently in Shipall Airport and they had this sign on the door as you walked into Shipall Airport, which I've kind of blown up in text over here so you can see it properly. And basically what they're saying is they're doing exactly what I just showed in the demo. And they're doing that to see how people move around the airport. So to see, here's a person coming in. Now can we see that same address at check-in? Can we see it at security? Can we see it in the shops? To understand how people move around the airport and how kind of traffic and volume flows work in there. That's a really simple example of following those kind of physical digital trails that we're leaving around the place. Another one that we see all the time in our kind of online experiences uh, arise from the notion of cookie pools. So people are probably familiar with cookies. We all see those warnings now on web pages to say, you know, this web page collects cookies. So cookies are just little files that web pages place on your computer when you visit a particular page so that if you come back to that same page, they can recognize that this is still you. And the thing that's kind of become more common recently is this idea of cookie pools where rather than just one page uh, managing all of their own cookies, those cookies start to get shared in pools. And the upshot of this is that we see this kind of thing happen. So here's me, uh, again, trying to torment my poor little girl with things that I'm going to buy online for. So I'm going to buy her some sunglasses. And I have a look at these, and I say, well, she's never going to wear those. I'll leave it. And then I'm reading an article online, and bam, here is an ad again for those sunglasses. So I'm not on Amazon anymore. I'm somewhere else. But these glasses are starting to follow me around. And then I go to a different site, and look, there's the glasses again. And then I go somewhere else, and look, there they are. And eventually, I'm going to give in. Right? And I'm going to say, right. I must be, I should, I should buy these. Something in the world is saying I should buy these, so I should give in and do it. And the reason for that is this notion of cookie pools. So although these sites that I'm visiting, so in this case, wired.com, they don't have access to that data, what they are doing is saying, you know, in this advertising spot, some third party can put whatever they like in there. All right, so there's a third party advertising network that does have access to that Google, the Amazon data that wired, in this case, have said, you just look after the ads pop whatever you like in there. So now we see that these digital trails are widening out across the internet when we visit different places. So we're seeing the, the results of those, those trails in more and more different places. So they're kind of the simplest things that we can do. So the simplest things we can do is recognize, OK, there are these digital trails. And we can start to follow them. And we can start to do some interesting little things with that. The more interesting things that we can do with this data, though, comes from recognizing patterns. And that's why I throw up this picture. Uh, we're really good at this. So here's a picture that maybe at first looks like a fairly random collection of black and white blobs. But if you think about dogs, and in particular Dalmatians, at some point you might realize, OK, there's a, a Dalmatian here in the middle. Right? So that's maybe Dalmatian walking along. When I've done this, people see all kinds of strange things in this corner. I think that might be like one of those ink blot charts that says more about you than the picture. Um, but we're really good at this. So we can take this relatively random collection of black and white blobs, and we can recognize the pattern that this is a picture of a Dalmatian. Computers are still really bad at this, but what they are really good at is taking great big data sets, and we're not meant to see any great sense in this, but taking a great big data set like this and finding patterns in those data sets. And in particular, for this, we use machine learning, and this is a bit of a shameless plug for my textbook uh, in machine learning, but which I wanted to put up there in particular. It recently got translated into Korean, so I'm told that says the same thing in Korean, but if there's anyone who speaks Korean, uh, they can confirm that. And what machine learning does is analyzes great big data sets like this and finds patterns inside those data sets. And what I want to talk about is two particular things that get done with those patterns and are done all the time with these patterns by lots and lots of different services, which are to recognize your demographics, interests, and preferences, and then try to predict what you might do next. So if we look at the first one first, um, Twitter is really interesting in that if you sign up for a Twitter account, you give Twitter very little information about yourself. So this is the login screen for Twitter. You need to give them a phone number or an email address. You need to choose a password. And you may give them a full name. You can type whatever you like in this box. It doesn't matter. You may give them your actual name. And that makes it very easy to sign up for a Twitter account, and I guess makes one of the reasons why Twitter gets so many people. But Twitter's business is based on selling ads and selling very targeted, specific ads to specific groups of people. So here are some of the screenshots of going through the process of setting up an ad campaign on Twitter. 
And you can see here I start my campaign, and then I can start to choose things like who would I like to see my ads? So what gender am I interested in advertising to, males or females? And it gets very, very detailed. What kind of interests would I like the people that I'm advertising to to have? And you can see if we look, these are the categories that I get to choose, and it gets very detailed from cars to luxury cars to performance cars and lots and lots of other bits and pieces. So the interesting question then is how do Twitter go from just your email address and phone number and maybe your name to this really rich picture of you that they can use to drive advertising and drive targeted advertising? Well, the way they do it is by looking for patterns in your data. So Twitter is kind of interesting. So that's the data that I, I provide signing in. The other data that we get are my tweets. Right? So this is my Twitter account. These are my tweets. And don't forget we mentioned metadata uh, previously. So when I'm tweeting, where I'm tweeting, maybe what devices I'm tweeting on. They also have the timeline, so all the people that I follow, whatever those people are tweeting, that data is all available as well. That has some relation to me, so I must be interested in this in some way. And then more directly, the network of people who follow me and people who I follow, that's all kind of interesting. That might tell me uh, some kind of more detailed information about who I might be. So what Twitter and lots of other people try to do is take this data and from this data, infer all those other characteristics so we can go from just my email address and my phone number out to a rich picture of who I am. And this is the second demo that I want to show you uh, where we'll look at this. And some people might have seen I, I tweeted this out and I got, it, it didn't start too well. I don't think I'm cut out for viral marketing. Um, but as the morning went on, I got more and more responses to this of people who will be involved in this demo. So basically, this is a set of the Twitter handles for people who responded uh, that they'd be interested in this demo. And what we're going to do is show how we can infer or predict the gender of these people and their interests. And I just want to show you how this works. So starting with gender, um, if we try and look at all this data, I'm a machine learning researcher, so I would try and attack this with machine learning models. I'd say, well, I'm going to take in the tweet content and the follower graph. That should all tell me rich stuff about somebody's gender. And I'll build a predictive model, and it'll do that. And we tried to do that, and it didn't work very well. Um, so we have a big data set uh, with Twitter handles and marked up genders of who they are. And we did quite badly at it until one of my clever uh, PhD students said, well, you know the name that most people fill in. If I was trying to guess somebody's gender, that's what I'd look at. Right? I wouldn't go and look at their tweets and look at their network. I'd look at their name. And I said, that's, that's a great idea. Uh, I'm going to steal that. Um, once we have a name, all, pretty much all of the central statistics offices around the world publish baby name lists. Right, so every year, and the, the Irish Times and the newspapers always get a couple of nice articles about this to say, well, what are the popular baby names this year, and what does that tell us? Well, we can get this data, and you can get this data going back a long way, and you can get it for pretty much any country um, in the world. And if you take this data, this gives you lists of boys' names and girls' names. If you take the first part of the name that someone fills in on Twitter and assume that must be their first name, and then compare it to these lists, you can say, is this number higher? for this name as a boy's name, or higher for this name as a girl's name, or does it not appear on one of these lists? And that turns out to be an incredibly reliable way to predict gender. So you don't have to work that hard to predict gender. What you do need to do is augment the original data set that we have with this other interesting data set that gives me richer information from it. So we can do that. And here are the, the Twitter names that I got. And if I divide them up into male and female, this is where they land. Um, so we did OK in this. So hopefully some people will see themselves up here and they can tell uh, whether they believe what's happened here or whether they don't believe what's happened here. Uh, these two are left in the middle, and they're left in the middle because they didn't fill in their full names or didn't quite fill in their full names. So JK Tool 99, that person filled in their name as JK Tool, and obviously nobody else in Ireland has ever been christened JK. Uh, so in my CSO data, JK doesn't appear. It doesn't appear in the boys' names, doesn't appear in the girls' names, so we don't know who that is, uh, and Ken B65 filled in their full name as Ken B65. Right, so they didn't give us any information beyond that, so the system doesn't work. We can fall back on the content-based version, so where we actually look at the text, and it guesses that these go into the male category. I don't really know uh, what the right answer to these is, uh, but that's the guess that we make. And if Ken B or JK Tool are in the room, they can tell us uh, whether we're right or wrong on that. But that's pretty easy to do, and you can do that fairly well. Right? So it works most of the time. Predicting interest is a bit more interesting and a little bit more tricky. And here we do bring in all the data. So if I want to make a model or recognize 
from Twitter data what kind of things somebody's interested in. Well, the things that I can look at that might be really useful here are their tweets, the timeline of all the tweets uh, that they're reading, and then some information about their followers. So what we do in this example is we suck in all that information uh, for the people with these Twitter handles. And again, that's all public information. It's quite easy to do. It's a, a few lines of code to, to gather up that information. We suck it all in, and then we train up models to recognize the topic of different tweets. Right? And again, we've got great big data sets that are marked up as this is a tweet about sports, this is a tweet about politics, this is a tweet um, about entertainment. And we can train up machine learning models to take any piece of text and predict this one is about sport, this one is about politics, this one is about entertainment. So we take all the tweets for a person, we put them through that model, and we get all the answers out, and then we see the frequency of the different categories. So if all of the tweets that you're tweeting are about sport, well, you must be really interested in sport. If they're kind of half and half between sport and politics, well, they're your two big interests. And here's a couple of examples. So here's a person, and this is how their interests kind of boil down uh, for their top interests uh, that they have according to our predictive model. Here's a different person who's very interested in the environment and has kind of other kind of smaller interests. And we've done that for everybody. So in this data set, again, we've gone through everybody there. We've sucked in all their Twitter data. We've ran that through our prediction models to predict the, the topics of all those tweets and all that content. So both the tweets that they're tweeting themselves and the tweets that they're reading from the people that they follow. Um, and then we've kind of built that interest profile for them. And if we divide them up into their most common interests, this is where they land. So again, hopefully if some of the people are here, they'll see themselves there and they can say yes or they can say no. But the interesting thing about it is our model, maybe it's not as good as the one that Twitter uses, but they're doing exactly the same thing. And whatever that model says is what you're interested in, as far as Twitter are concerned, that's what you're interested in. And as far as they're kind of generating ads and kind of putting ads towards you, you're going to see ads based on these interests that they, they believe that you have. And that's great, because now what I can do is say, well, if I'm interested in generating ads for, for women who are interested in computing, well, I can pull out the subset of my data set of those people. Or if I'm interested in men who are interested in society and politics, well, I can pull out that set from my data set. And this is exactly what people like Twitter are doing um, in order to drive that targeted advertising towards you. And it's interesting, and it works, um, and it works pretty well. They do it much more, much beyond, say, simply just doing gender and age. Actually, there's a nice article by Facebook who, who described the 98 different things that they try to infer about Facebook users. And obviously, there's a version of this that became very kind of buzzy and interesting in the news but around this company, Cambridge Analytica. And what Cambridge Analytica proposed to do is, using very similar techniques, predict your, your personality, essentially. So they use this, this thing, the ocean model, which describes personality according to these five dimensions, openness, neuroticism, extroversion. And what they believe and what they claim is that they can do a pretty good job of recognizing your personality from Facebook and other data that they're able to generate. And the, the thing that they've been supposedly doing is using that to drive targeted advertising around elections. Um, and it's kind of interesting, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of confusion about exactly what might be going on and what they might not be doing. But in some ways, for me, that's not terribly surprising. So this is just the same targeted advertising uh, that everybody else is doing. It's maybe a little interesting because this notion of personality is so obvious in it, uh, but it's not a million miles away from looking at things like interests uh, likelihood to do something interesting in the future. So that brings me on to the last thing that I just want to look at is, and this is the other big area that people use machine learning and analysis of data to, to understand people. And it's about understanding propensities or likelihood of somebody to do something in the future. So if you've ever had a phone call from your mobile phone provider to offer you some free credit or to offer you a new upgrade, it's probably not because they've just decided you're a good person. It's probably because there's a model that has flagged you as a churn risk. So there's a model there that says, this person is about to leave us and go to one of our competitors. So what we should do is we should jump in quick, um, and we should offer them something nice, and that'll make them stay. Mobile phone companies do this a lot. Every, lots of other companies do this. Mobile phone companies are particularly good at it because they have very rich data about their customers. So all that data they have about the way that you use your phone, who you ring, when you do it, that gives them a very good picture of who you are and gives them the ability to do this very accurately. And the way they do it is really simple. So what they do is they take historical data. So they take a data set about their customers. They pick some point in time. And they say, OK, let's look at who left after that point in time, so in some little time horizon. 
and who stayed. So in this, the blue people are the people who stayed, the orange people are the people who left. And they gather up a great big data set, probably thousands and thousands of customers, and describe them according to these two categories. Then they extract some interesting descriptions of those customers. So in the mobile phone scenario, you might be interested in somebody's age, their job, has their bill changed recently, what kind of handset have they got, so do they have right up to the minute um, handsets or do they have that old Nokia phone still, uh, what's the kind of balance in terms of making calls using data uh, that they use. So if we can describe people according to that kind of data, what we can then do is use a machine learning algorithm to recognize the pattern that identifies someone who's about to churn versus somebody who isn't. And we can do this pretty accurately. Um, this is a, an example of the kind of simple model that we might build using the decision trees, all kinds of interesting uh, machine learning algorithms. Let me zoom into a bit of it. It's kind of obvious the kind of stuff it might pull out. So if you're going outside your package, you might churn. Um, depending on how expensive your handset is, you might be more or less of a churn risk. So it's basically extracting patterns based on that data. And then once we have those patterns, we can take all of our current customers, apply this model to them, and it'll tell us these are the people who are likely to churn next month, these are the people who aren't, and then you do or don't get a phone call on the back of that. So this is a simple example of propensity modeling. Uh, propensity modeling has been around for a long time. The machine learning techniques for this are, are kind of relatively advanced and they, they work pretty well. And what we're seeing now is those kind of techniques moving out to more and more things. So we can do churn, we can do the prediction of the likelihood of somebody to vote, we can do the likelihood of somebody to buy something. One of the, the more kind of interesting examples of this that again got a lot of press, and this was mentioned in a couple of the talks yesterday, are some of the, the ways that this is being used in the law. So there's this particular system that's used in a lot of states in the US that makes predictions about recidivism risk. So if somebody's up for parole, are they likely to reoffend in the future or not? And the picture is exactly the same as it was there a second ago because we use exactly the same techniques. So these people use exactly the same techniques. So they take a great bit da data set of historical incidents and they see who are the people who were given parole and didn't reoffend or behaved uh, and who are the people who did reoffend. And then given that great big data set, they extract the features that might tell the difference between those two groups and they build a model that predicts the difference between those two groups. So this is a particular system uh, that's used, uh, in, like I say, in a number of states in the US. Some details are filled in and then a judge at a parole hearing essentially has a laptop or an iPad with a screen very like this that they have a look at and this says, you know, the likelihood of future criminal activity from this person in this case is high and that should feed into that decision that they're making. And it's very interesting, so it's using exactly the same techniques that we're talking about, that churn analysis, but using it in a more targeted, um, more narrow way to predict the likelihoods that somebody is about to do something. Now, the, the way that the judge is meant to use this is they're meant to take this as one piece of information that falls into their overall decision. Uh, but it's one example of how we're seeing, because of our ability to collect and store data from lots and lots of different areas, we're seeing these, these types of predictive modeling approaches being used in more and more areas and being used to help more and more decisions. So we see this in farming, we see it in sports, we see it in education, uh, we see it in finance, we see it in energy, um, HR, basically anything you can imagine, somebody is using a predictive model based on great big data sets that they're collecting to help people make some kind of decisions. And just to kind of start to wrap up, one kind of response to that is, well, who cares? We've been doing this forever. So this is a screenshot of Edmund Halley's life table from 1693, and this to a large extent was the beginning of big data, and it was certainly the beginning of actuarial science. So I think this is the first example of someone coming up with calculations of risk, so it's essentially life assurance uh, risk that they're coming up with. And people have been doing this since 1693, so that's well, a little over 300 years ago now. So is anything different? And to a large extent, no. So we're collecting data, we're building models using that data to make predictions about what might happen in the future, and then we're using those predictions to try and help people make better decisions. The thing that I think is interesting is this idea that the data that we can collect is bigger and broader than maybe it's ever been before. So with all these things that we do online, with the phones that we carry, with the wearable devices that we're putting on, there's these richer data sets that allow us to do these kind of jobs in more and more areas of our lives. I'll leave you one example though just to show this, this isn't perfect by any stretch. So I get this email from LinkedIn and I get a version of it every six months or so. And it's basically the groups that LinkedIn have that they think I might be interested in. 
And the one that always pops up is women in machine learning and data mining. And I think it's a nice example of how these algorithms are good, but they're not perfect by any stretch. So what's happening here is LinkedIn's analysis algorithm is looking at all the people who are in that group. They're looking at their interests and their characteristics. They're interested in machine learning. They have jobs like I do. So I look like someone who should join this group, except for the fact that I'm not a woman. But the data doesn't really pull that out. Right? I'm mostly just like these people. So the algorithm says, yeah, you should probably join that group. And I think it's just a nice example. This stuff is good, but it's not perfect by any stretch. And there's lots, lots more work to do. So thanks very much for your attention on that. Hopefully, that was an interesting uh, tour through some of the things that people are doing with data. Um, I'll finish up there. I'd just like to thank the, the RIA for allowing me to do this, this kind of series of talks. I've had a great time doing it. Um, and hopefully, other people have enjoyed them. And I know there's, there's flyers around. Alan's going to talk more about this. And people should apply for this for next year. It was a great time. So thanks very much for that. Thanks, Brian. Um, we have time for some, uh, for some questions uh, or interactions from the audience, if anybody wants to. Um, do we have any uh, Slido questions that have come in yet? No? No, not yet. OK, well, that's fine. Let's make it informal then. Yes. So Hi, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was just looking at the, the example you gave about the law, the, the example you gave about the recidivism and the, uh, and, the, yeah. and the scoring mechanism. How do we prevent ourselves from using that? And, and you kind of alluded to it, but the, the judge sits there. He's supposed to use it yeah. as just one piece of information. Yeah. But it's very easy to, to trust data and yeah. say, well, look, I don't want to use my own personal opinion. There's data yeah. here that tells me what, I want, what I've got to do. I'll take that decision because it's easy. How, how do we prevent ourselves from doing that? I, I don't know the answer to that, and I think that's a massive issue. Uh, so one of the things that I think is interesting, around that same system, one of the states kind of passed a law relatively recently, this Flickr case, where they said, you know, the judge must not just use this score. They must use other things. And... I don't know what that means, that they must not, do they need to go away and think for a little while or something like that. So I think it's really hard to do that. And there are lots of examples of where what, exactly what you describe has happened. So one in particular, so credit risk modeling in banks is kind of ahead, people have been doing this for years, is ahead of the other uses of, of modeling around data that we're doing. And credit risk modeling in banks is very regulated. And one of the regulations is, well, if you apply for a loan, a model says this is your likely risk. Someone looks at that output and then they take into account that piece of information and all the other things that they as a banking professional know um, and make the ultimate decision. So they're not meant to just use the output of the model. But the thing that's happened is if you agree with the output of the model, you don't have to do anything as a, as a person who's working in that scenario. If you disagree with the output, there's a form you have to fill in. Um, you've got to convince somebody. If you turn out to be wrong, uh, that you, the model doesn't get blamed, you get blamed instead. And the impact of that is nobody disagrees with the model. Uh, to a large extent, even though they're told they should. Um, and that's a huge risk that we have to take because people put so much confidence into these. So the kinds of things that people are trying to do is you'll hear the phrase explainable AI and explainable modeling a lot, is to try and move away from that pretty blunt prediction of from 0 to 10, this person is a 10, um, and try and enrich those outputs from the models to say, this person is a 10, here's why this person is a 10, here are the kind of things that if they had changed a bit, this person might have been a two or a three, except for whatever the thing might be. So it's a huge problem, and it's, I think we're gonna, we're gonna see it more and more, and you can see in the, I think the banking, the credit scoring example is a good example where people have tried to fix it by putting some regulation about that, but then the, the what would you say, the, the other structures that build around that just make it it's easier to agree with the model, so that's what we'll do. Um, so there's massive work to be done there, and we're not, not close to having figured that out yet. So, so one, of, one of the things that we saw this morning in the, in the large auditorium in the panel discussion uh, was uh, uh, at one point Mark Little uh, and Vince Cerf were talking about uh, bias uh, in predictiveness and whether it's churn or whether it's yeah. judges or whatever. And, and Mark was making the point that you know, the algorithm which is used to run this is coded by humans and therefore there's the danger that the, there might be human uh, biases built into the algorithms. And I was almost jumping up and down and saying, no, it's not just the algorithms that, that introduce the bias. More and more, it's the data that has yeah. the bias. And the classic example which has come up repeatedly in the last two days is the face app. Uh, application which sort of beautifies your face by making you more white um, uh, and it's been on stage mentioned yeah. many times so uh, so so picking up on, on your point how, how much of this 
um, inherent bias is, is it's not algorithmic because the algorithm is public, it's open, it's procure, you can just buy your book, there's another plug for it by the way, yeah. and, and read it and understand how it works, but it's the data that has got those inherent Com biases. Completely, exactly. So the, the models, like you said there, the model basically is a dumb thing that's a pattern recognizer that looks through the data set and says, well, what are the indicators that go from this to this? Um, and whatever biases are in those data sets are going to turn out to be in those in those models that we learn because, or certainly at the moment, unless we do better things to build them. And the, the judge example is a good one. I choose that because there's been an awful lot of press around that that people have done some some studies of those models and pulled out pretty serious biases that seem to be baked into those models. And those biases come from the fact that it's, it's particularly around African American people are much more likely to be predicted as reoffenders in that model, and it. The, the explanation they give in some of the analysis of this is that in the data sets that they're training it on, because of biases within the policing systems, that those people are more likely to have been in parole hearings and are more likely to have ended up not being given parole. And that, that just gets baked in. So yeah, and that's baked in because there's more of them. The so, so how much of, of explainable AI is, is not just about explaining the factors which influence yeah. whether you got that credit rating or whether you got that parole or not, but is, is about explaining where's the data that drove that. So I think even the data that drove it, or the thing that I think has real potential is saying, if we change this from this to this, this would have given you a different answer. So trying to let people explore, okay, if you take the example of the, the parole, so we had a person, we made our prediction based on that person. If this person had been a little bit younger, a little bit older, what would, have, what would have made the difference and pulling out the things that would have pushed this over the line from a, a re-offend to a non-re-offend and illustrating those to people to try and help them understand, well, these are some of the biases that are maybe, maybe in there. So I think that's a big thing. Um, definitely look at the data sets, but it becomes very difficult to, to try and communicate those big data sets mm. uh, to people because the, the whole point of using these models, I guess, is that you take big very multivariate data sets, so data sets with lots and lots of columns, essentially. And it does become tricky to, to pull out, you know, well, this is what the data that this model was trained on looks like. But I think in the one part of it that maybe is becoming more and more important is, and again, the, the recidivism prediction model is a good example of this, making those data, data sets public in some ways. Um, so obviously you can't make them completely public, but making them public in some ways so people are aware of those things. The big thing that's being given out a lot about that particular model is there's a private company who have built that model. They tell a little bit about how it works, but it's, it's a, a closed mm. um, box and you can't get at either the data or the model to a large extent. So another deployment of that judges, yeah, and I'll get you a second, I'm on a roll now, last point I make. Um, <laughs> that, that, judges, that judges dashboard isn't just a yes, no and a scale, it could be uh, some sliders. So he or she could play with, well, what if that person was younger and you slide it down? Or what if that person was a different gender or had a different background? So you end up playing with it. And each time you played with this, you, you slice and dice the data set exactly. that's used to make that prediction yeah. differently. Yeah, I think that, or, and even to make suggestions to say, well, you know, if this person was slided down to be younger, that would have made a huge difference. Okay. So you should think about that a little bit. Okay, Ruth. Hi, Brian. Thanks a million for, for a great talk. But what I wanted to ask you is about the responses that you got from the public when you were out giving this talk. I yeah. suppose two things. One, I'm just interested in what were the kind of key concerns and issues that came up when you were out around the country <clears throat> giving the talk? And I suppose secondly, did anything, any feedback that you got when you were out giving the public talk come back to the research group and, and change anything that you were doing there? The, so I guess... So to do the, the last bit first, that, that last bit about the explanations and things, that's kind of, we're doing a little bit on that now and that's come directly from discussions around this talk in particular, um, which is, is directly from that. I think one, yeah, I think one bit of feedback that I think is really good is that people kind of, I didn't know that was happening. So I didn't know this data was being collected and not in a good or a bad way, but just, you know, it's good to know. So I, I always give the example that where I should know better, but I got caught out on this. Uh, when I first got my Netflix subscription, I didn't realize it was connected to my Facebook account. And my brother rang me up to ask me to do something. I said, no, I'm too busy. I can't do that. And he said, well, I've just looked at Netflix. You're at home watching Breaking Bad. Uh, I can see that. <laughs> and that kind of thing is a good example. I, I'm a computer scientist. I do all this. I should know better than to do that. But I think a thing that's been, I think, really interesting is people just aren't aware of how much little bits of data are being generated and how some of that data can be connected together to do interesting things. And again, that's not a good or a bad thing, it's just a thing that people don't know is going on. So it's been really great where people say, oh wow, that's great, you can do that. And then the second part of that is 
there are some good examples of these data sets where they are available for you to go and look at. So people like Google and Facebook and Twitter are doing a better and better job of providing tools for you to look around at the data that they collect about you. And that can be a really interesting thing to do. So the, the Google one in particular, you can look at your search timeline and see basically since as long as you've been using Google and have been maybe signed in with an account, every search term you've ever typed in to Google. And that can be a fun thing to look at over time. You can say, oh look, here's where I changed job or here's where I moved house or here's where I'm feeling that holiday. And lots of people I've gotten feedback for who have gone and looked around in some of those tools. Um, that I think I had some of them on the last slides. Are, the links are pretty easy to find. Um, I guess the trickier one, and the one where I run out of steam a little bit on this, so I'm a computer scientist, I do machine learning. I'm on the, if everyone remembers, there was the, the example in Jurassic Park of, you know, we asked if we could do it rather than whether we should do it. I land on the could side rather than the should side because you see good problems, you go, wow, yeah, we could do that. And if we got that data from here, we could do that. If we got that data from here, we could do that, and that's great. Um, lots of people do end up in the, well, is this okay? Should we be doing it? Should we not be doing it? And I think there's loads of interesting questions there. I think there's as many good ones as bad ones, um, or there's ma as many positive potentials as negative potentials. Um, and I think that's, that's really interesting stuff. And I think a key thing with that is, yeah, it's not me who sh should be asking a lot of those questions. So uh, we're scientists and engineers, and are going to want to build things, and are going to want to put this together and that together. Um, and it's, it's good, and, and we're seeing the same, the, the research centers that are around, people are putting the effort into looking at those, those other questions as well. Um, I, but I think that's really interesting, and I suppose the thing that I've been trying to get is, I think maybe in the first time I gave this, we ended up in the, this is terrible, and it shouldn't be happening, kind of end point. Um, and I, I think that's an easy place to end up, where you say, oh, this is terrible, we should turn everything off, and I think that's the wrong answer. Um, so I guess one thing I've been trying to do is to make it more look there's, there's, there's as many good things we can do with all this data as there are things that you mightn't want to happen with all this data. Okay, anybody else? No? Okay, well, we're actually pretty close to time uh, finishing up. So um, I, once again, I'd like to thank Brian for his presentation. And, oh, one quick one. Oh, yeah, sorry, I missed. That was right on time. Um, I'm, I'm Lauren Cyrillus. I'm a reporter at Politico in Brussels. I was... Uh, uh, sorry? Great. I've <laughs> done a lot of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering if um, if you had any recommendations to... I mean, for instance, in, in the European Parliament, there's a discussion to what extent algorithms can be put into some kind of uh, tool that looks at how it generates results. Uh, so basically, keeping trade secrets and algorithms for companies who want to make money out of it and at the same time have a certain degree of transparency um, for the public for the public good basically yeah. is this feasible you think can you sort of scrutinize or can without going open source can you scrutinize what a uh, what what an algorithm is doing so so I think there's two parts to that so if we think breaking it down so if you have trained up a model can you understand what it is that that model learned. And then the second part, I guess, is can you still, if you could do that, can you keep some secrets uh, for somebody in terms of trade secrets and commercial advantage? So the first part is actually really tricky. Um, so again, we do work on this, and there's lots of work going on on this. So in I showed an example of a tree model, and that's kind of the simplest thing that you can do. And people still use lots of decision trees. Uh, and one of the reasons they use them is because it does make it easy to interrogate that model and say, OK, we, the model gave us this answer, and here's why. Because you were young, and you had this phone, and you have this average bill, so therefore, we think you're going to leave. And that's quite nice. They, those models can get a bit big and a bit complicated, um, but they're still relatively interpretable. The problem that we see on that side of the question is, as you want to make more and more accurate models that deal with more bigger, messier data sets, is you move away from that. So one simple step that you take is you go from one tree to a thousand trees. And they're all slightly different, and then they all vote together on here's what the answer should be, and that becomes your final prediction. And even that small step where you're still using trees, which are nice kind of structures to understand, moving from one to a thousand of them, um, now understanding what it is that this model has learned becomes quite difficult. So as we move to more and more complicated um, models that we use, and so that, that step from trees to ensembles or groups of trees, and then the big thing that everybody does now is, is deep learning, which are neural networks. They're doing the same kind of job, but the internals of those models are very hard to interrogate and pull out. 
um, hear exactly is what this model is doing. So that first part of the question is still really hard. There's lots of people doing good work on it. There's lots of people trying. There's nice techniques that come up. So like we talked about here with sliders to explore, here's what might happen, or nice visualizations of here's what this model looks like it's learning. But that first part of the question is actually really, really tricky um, to do. And so there's, there's lots of interesting things left to do on that. The second part of the question, um, I don't know a whole lot about. I know there are people, people talk about the idea of differential privacy as a key thing here where you keep data sets anonymized, but at the same time enable people to use them to build models and to learn patterns. Um, I guess if you, when you can do that, well then the model maybe is inter you're able to interrogate it, but you can still keep some kind of trade secrets. Maybe one thing that we do an amount of that does work actually that maybe answers a little of both questions. So one thing that we often do is if we train, let's say a very complicated model, so an idea of my thousand trees, um, what I can then do is make a simple version of that model that's just one tree. Now that simple version won't capture exactly what the more complicated one does, but maybe it gives me a decent, it gives me an okay approximation. So I just do this a lot. If I'm trying to explain, if I'm trying to convince someone, you know, my model works, um, I'll convince them by saying, look, we tested it on some test data and it's 99% accurate, but then I also want to give them, and here's the kind of thing that it's doing, because if people kind of believe the sort of things that it's doing, they'll have much more confidence in it. So one thing we do a lot is we'll build this big complicated model to make it as accurate as possible, and then from that, we can boil it back down to a simpler version that won't be nearly as accurate, but hopefully captures an amount of what the, the bigger, more complicated model does that allows us to explain, you know, here's the kind of thing that's going on in here. And maybe that's an interesting step for the trade secrets piece where you can say, I, I guess maybe, yeah, would secret recipes be the equivalent of that? So maybe Coca-Cola is made of these five ingredients, but it's the, the blend of the ingredients and how much of each one, that's what counts. So maybe there's an equivalent um, there, but definitely there are two big interesting questions. Um, I guess in, if I go back to the, the banking scenario, one of the things that's common in, in banking, so going back to that idea of predicting whether you're gonna pay back a loan or not, people have been doing that for, for years, it's very regulated. One of the, the artifacts of that regulation is people don't in that scenario use these, let's say more accurate modeling techniques that give us bigger or more complicated models. They use decision trees and logistic regression models because they are pretty easy to interrogate. Um, so that's kind of where, that's the answer in that solution is don't use the more accurate models. Um, that, I guess, doesn't work in, in lots of places. Okay, thanks very much. We have to leave it at that. Um, let's thank Brian for his presentation. Do you want to announce your competition? Competition. Um, uh, and as I said at the, the top of this session, this was the, the, the homecoming uh, uh, event for Brian. He's given this um, uh, lecture uh, around the country, literally around the, the country. And because the, um, uh, the, the, um, the series, the lecture series, has been successful. Uh, we're going to run it again for uh, 2018. So submissions for uh, the uh, Royal Irish Academy Engineering and Computer Science lecture, for which Brian has just given, uh, are now open. And if you think or if you know, know somebody who thinks that they can give uh, a, a lecture like this, um, then please do consider uh, applying. There's yellow flyers uh, on the tables, and there's also um, information on it. Uh, in the Royal Irish Academy website, ria.ie. Um, the topic doesn't have to be about data science. Uh, it can be any topic of choosing um, within the engineering and computing uh, domain. The data summit event suited the topic of Brian's talk, which is why we've been able to bring it back here. Um, and it's a Dublin lecture followed by a tour of the country ending up again. Uh, and the 2018 series, uh, for which is described in the, uh, in the yellow flyer there, is sponsored by Hewlett Packard Enterprises in Galway, and we're very grateful to them for their sponsorship. Uh, we now have tea and coffee on the ground floor, and we resume at the session of your choice at 11.15. Thank you.